Uh, my name is Len Freed. I live at uh, 28 South Point Road. Uh, I've worked on budgets off and on for many years, ranging from millions of dollars to hundreds of millions of dollars to literally billions of dollars. However, the principles pretty much remain the same no matter what the monetary value is. And that is, what you don't do is you don't do a bottoms-up budget. A bottoms-up budget means people in departments figure out how much money they need, they roll it up, a department head then takes that number and comes to some committee, like a board of finance, and says, this is what I need. The board of finance tries to intelligently try to whittle that down to see if they really need that. That's a waste of time because people, budgets made by people, people want to do their jobs right, and it's easy to do your job right if you have more resources, if you have more, more people, if you have more materials, if you have more equipment, so it's just natural that people want as much money as possible. If I was Jack Horst and I was running the Board of Education, I would ask for all the money I could get, which is what? So it's natural that people, the budgets are always fat. And the way it has to be done is some group at a higher level has to basically say, look, this is what you spent last year, X, this year you're gonna spend 5% less. Figure out how to do it. And by the way, there can be no drop in services. Now, how do they do that? Normally, the department heads know where waste is. There's waste and inefficiencies everywhere. And if they don't know, the people in the departments certainly know. And you ask them. You ask the construction workers. So how can we save money? You ask even teachers. So tell me, you know, where are we wasting money? Not getting rid of teachers, but where, where do you see waste? They'll tell you. So there's ways to you benchmark. You look at what other towns are doing. Why is our course for student higher than other towns? Maybe there's a good reason. Maybe it's not. And you carefully benchmark these things. So what I'm telling you is, you, you can have your cake and eat it, kind of. Meaning that you can keep all the services, cut the budget, and still basically get what, you, get what you're getting before. The thing it takes is some hard work. It takes some rolling up your sleeves, really looking at hard numbers. Of course, the Board of Finance, no one's paid here, and they, they work very hard as it is. But it can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, Kirk Carr, and I'm Osmond Cameron South. Uh, it's very difficult to argue with the sentiments that people in this town have for the town of Clinton. It's a wonderful town. The people who work as volunteers, such as with your Board of Finance, Board of Education. Um, those of us who think that uh, the budgets are too high, the surpluses are not doing us a service, um, do not disrespect the Board of Education. We don't disrespect the Board of Finance. Uh, we value many of the same things that those of you who think that we should just increase the budget, whatever amount it needs to be. Um, and obviously, there are a lot more people that, on, uh, at the last referendum who agreed with us than perhaps agreed with some of you who have spoken earlier. Um, Clinton now has the highest mill rate on the shoreline, and you've all heard of that. Two of our neighboring towns have not raised their mill rate, will not raise it this year. So the gap is going to grow. We're going to become even more expensive as a result of that. Um, I've written a lot of memos to the Board of Finance suggesting ways that they could reduce the budget. Uh, and you have to realize that budgets and spending are two different things. I'm not suggesting a, a big drop in spending. Although I'll agree with Lynn, it probably could be done there. And, and as we go forward uh, to build this school, to have this wastewater uh, solution, we can't expect the tax taxpayers to bear 100% of that burden. They just can't do it. It's not possible. They won't do it. I mean, what you saw at this last uh, referendum, when they start getting the bill for the new school, they're going to come out in droves. And many of you who have worked for the school, I think, when you get the bill, when you see how much it's going to cost, I think you're going to be shocked. I think you've been misled uh, about the cost. I think you've been misled about what you're going to get. I think you've just been a baby switch on it. Um, so this is about the school, is it? Cut it out. This is a public hearing. You can speak his mind. Excuse me? He's got every right to speak just anyway. like anyone else. But anyway, the thing is, is that in preparation for that, we need to get serious now about every budget. And most of the money happens to be in the Board of Education. But there's some limitations because of the minimum budget requirement. It's going to be very difficult to go forward and make ends meet with all the obligations that this town has undertaken. And uh, the taxpayers are saying no. They said they've had enough. They did it in referendum. Many of them will not get up and say what I've said because, frankly, 
They get intimidated by many of the people in this room. They, their, their neighbors will, will shun them. Uh, they won't, you know, they will, uh, they're, they're just not comfortable. We did a, a survey of, of people who uh, are CTA uh, fans, and many of them don't even come to these meetings, partly because they don't think that the Board of Finance listens, but also because they couldn't, they wouldn't get up and say anything for fear of being attacked and being um, abused because of it. So with that in mind, um, many of the people here, I think, agree with me, will not get up and say what I'm saying. Um, but I hope you'll take it to heart. It's not meant to be mean. I think we can disagree without being disagreeable. I find that very hard for, for some people in town. Uh, but I think we need to respect one another's point of view, and just because I differ with yours doesn't make me a bad person. Thank you very much, and thanks for coming out. Ben Cimino, 161 East Main. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Board of Finance for doing a good job in finding some surplus funds in the town budget. And secondly, and more importantly, I'd like to thank everyone who's here tonight, because the last time we had a public hearing, it was pretty sad. Uh, there was not a very good showing, and um, that's when you have a town meeting form of government. It's really important that you exercise your right and you show up. Um, if we had a crystal ball, if we had this magical crystal ball, I can tell you a couple of things that you would see in it. One would be that we're going to have to pay for a $64 million school. No one else is going to do it. We're going to have to do it. Two, we're going to have to pay for a new wastewater treatment solution. Estimates are about $70 million. We're going to have to pay for it. No one else. We can bond it. Yeah, it'll be bonded. Eventually, the bill comes to us. I spoke with Kevin Chambers, who is the, who's the director of the Bureau of Grants Administration for the State Board of Education. And he said what I've known all along. When the state of Connecticut instituted a minimum budget requirement, it was a huge mistake. His department spoke very loudly, but they could not convince the state that it was a big mistake. What's wrong with it? What's wrong with it is that the new budget is based on what is appropriated from the year before. Well, by definition, that will never go down. It will just keep increasing. So no one wants to take anything away from the children of Clinton. Nobody. Nobody in the town of Clinton wants to take anything from the children of Clinton. However, a couple of months ago, the same Board of Finance was given a report, and the estimated surplus was $868,000. Children of Clinton got everything that was in the budget, and there was a surplus, $868,000. Well, committees were formed, and lo and behold, we sit here today, and now that budget has been, that surplus has been reduced by about a half a million dollars. Both Kevin Chambers, as well as Brian Mahoney, who is the Chief Financial Officer for the Board of Education for the State of Connecticut, have confirmed that the town has the right to request a waiver on the minimum budget requirement, a reasonable waiver. If we were to request a 1% decrease in the minimum budget requirement, First of all, if we take the $249,000 that is above the minimum budget requirement, and then we add a 1% decrease, which would be approximately $315,000, now we're talking about $565,000. And when we talk about the uh, funds that were cut from the town side, and believe me, I wasn't here arguing for cutting the town side of the budget. I don't even think it's necessary, quite honestly. 
Uh, I think we have to maintain our services. It just so happens that it's always safety and services that gets cut when they start looking to, uh, once, a, once a budget is voted down. But we all know that the majority of your taxes go towards the education budget. So if we were to request a waiver um, and we ask to be able to reduce our MVR by just 1%, that wouldn't even, that's like a third of the surplus they ended up with this year. So if you take away the 249, the 315, the funds that, the surplus that the Board of Finance was able to find on the town side, there's no need for a tax increase. Is everybody happy at that point? I would hope so, because the kids are getting a full, everything that they got this year, more funds than, they, than were used this year, until we found out that there was a big surplus. Taxpayers who are going to be have to who are going to have to face these huge expenditures. Every one of everybody in this room is going to have to look at the cost of a new high school and a wastewater treatment solution and whatever else comes along comes along. So I would recommend that the board of education request a waiver and by the way although there would be an initial penalty it would lower the minimum budget requirement for years to come because as I said the minimum budget requirement is based on historic budgets thank you Ron Thomas, I live on Jefferson Circle uh, here in town. My wife and I moved here about three years ago. It's a lovely town. I agree with everyone on that. You know, I'm very proud of our Department of Public Works this past winter with the blizzards we had and the job they did. As everyone said, very good job. So uh, I just wanted to bring up a point that uh, what I see in the town, though, it's, yes, we have to maintain safe roads, keep our children as educated as best as we can as a community to keep the community growing. There's two sides to that story, to every uh, side of every story. Who is paying for this? I mean, uh, the educators in the town, yes, you, you want to maintain your services, uh, but at what cost? Eventually, when the wastewater pro project comes about and the new school finally hits the taxpayers, who can afford to live in the town? It, when, when we're getting like a 2%, 3% increase in, before that, those bills even hit, it's going to be exponential when we do get the bill for the, those uh, expensive items. So just take a look around at the town uh, houses in the town. When I drive up down the streets of this town, up down in Glenwood and so forth, I see a lot of houses in disrepair. That's not helping our economy uh, in a real estate market price of housing, if you notice in our town, is not going up, but some towns are, it's going down, at least in my neighborhood. Is. So that's my big concern. Please consider that in future years' budgets uh, to not overextend uh, the spending. Thank you. I'd just like to say that this is the first time that I've mentioned the uh, waiver with the, for the MDR, but it's the first time that I heard that we would have to reimburse the state. It wasn't my understanding. I, made, I, I did research it and made uh, and, and inquired, and the only thing that I was told was that uh, it could impact, uh, to some degree, uh, a grant, um, and that would be minimal. But if that is the case, and I'll try to find out if that is the case. But if that is the case, at the very least, I think in good faith, I think the, the Board of Education budget should be reduced to exactly the MBR. 
and uh, at least we'd be moving in the right direction. Uh, on the other hand, if it turns out that we don't need to reimburse that in the following years, uh, it's really important because it affects the MBR in all following, in all years that follow. So uh, I'll look into it. Hopefully Jack will too. And uh, but at the very least, let's reduce the board of ed to the MBR because we know that it produces surpluses every year. Thanks. First of all, I'd like to thank the Board of Finance. I don't always agree with all their decisions, and I let them know. And it comes back at me. <laughs> but they are a volunteer group. They work their butts off. They put in a lot of time. For that, I thank them. I thank everybody else for coming here tonight. It is what I've discussed some of the turnouts that we have for some of these meetings, um, other local meetings. Thank you, Kurt, for filming them so that a lot of people who can't make meetings can, can watch them. Um, I'm sorry we're at this point again. Each year we seem to get here. The town I haven't put as much thought into as I have on the education side. I was quite disappointed. I voted against it the first go round. I was quite disappointed that the initial reduction was as little as it, little as it was. I'm glad that it was increased. My reason is this. When I went down, I went to kind of a source. I called a few parents who still have kids in the school system, minor it out, and they're very well, very much connected to the uh, Board of Education. And I asked them, I said, you know, where can we cut? And they said, well, and I understand why, for the budgeting process, I gotta switch, I got no damage. Uh, for the budgeting process, I understand that you can't count on retirements that aren't in yet. And they explained that to me and it made sense. They also told me that during this process, there have been a minimum of four retirements that have paperwork submitted, et cetera. So I asked them, and then I also called a couple of people in other school systems. One's an administrator, one's a teacher. I said, okay, what can we realistically look at in terms of savings for four or five teachers? And they said, well, it's usually a top-end person who's leaving, and it's usually someone towards the bottom who's coming in. They said, figure four or five, a minimum $125,000, $150,000. And I have to take them at the worst, because I really don't know. I mean, I can look on salaries in the town reports and get a, a rough guess from that, but it seemed fairly reasonable to me. My kids went from the Clinton school systems. They got decent education, but I will tell you this, and you're not going to like it. There are a lot of people who my kids, my sons had, who now tell me, be very thankful that your kids are out of the school system. I don't ask for too many particulars, I know a lot of them, but these are teachers saying this. So you can judge from that. That's my personal experience. I don't know. But I would like to see a minimum of what is being cut for education, the education side coming up. I may yet still vote no until I get in the range that my friends suggested was fairly conservative, but very reasonable, certainly very reasonable. Um, that's just my point of view. Thank you. from teachers would be getting the straw that breaks the camel's back. There are teachers who are doing multiple jobs. Mrs. Bowen is one of them. She works in three, three different schools, is it? Or just two? Two. She has to go around to the two different schools 
and uh, manage her students in the different schools. Oh, and by the way, we can't afford a talented and gifted um, personnel. Oh, Mrs. Bowen, your, your children did really great in Clinton. Do you think you could do that too? Our talented and gifted program is tossed off to someone who is already overworked and working in two different schools because we can't afford two of her. We can't afford two of her. Now we're going to make her into three people because we can't help our top students. Because you know why? It's not required by the state. We have to identify these kids. We do not have to do a single service to them. Maybe that's why people say, you're lucky your kids aren't in the school. I propose we increase the budget so that Mrs. Bowen can be two people or three people. Thank you. Uh, Sandy, Luke, and I agree on something, uh, and that is, I think, that gifted education is probably one of the most underinvested things in public education today, and I think it's really important uh, as a national uh, priority. However, I, I'm talking about the uh, education budget uh, this year. Uh, there were two big areas that were cited. One was the teachers, which I understand you can't, uh, uh, retirements, which you can't predict even though they do happen year after year, and you probably could predict them if you tried, or at least conservatively predict them. But the other one is somewhat predictable, and that is the health insurance, which um, this year has a $490,000 surplus. Now, you're adding five people next year, uh, five additional uh, uh, full-time equivalent uh, people. About $15,466 goes for uh, health uh, benefits. So that's about 80,000. So, so there's 400,010 dollars that probably should have been taken out of the health budget this year and was not. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, when the taxpayers look through these dollars and look at what the Board of Education does, what the Board of Finance does, and you see that they're not looking at some of this as closely as they need to. And it's very troubling. And that's why uh, I would say that the, the budget should be, I agree with Ben Samita, that um, the education budget should be the minimum budget requirement probably this year and every year unless there's some really good extraordinary reason that it needs to be higher. You can fund that, um, that special education teacher with $490,000 or $400,000 of surplus. So if you said we need $100,000, $80,000 for another special education teacher, you'd still have room to take another $300,000 out of this budget. And um, that's what, we, what I would advocate. You could, still, you could do that and still be within be down the minimum budget requirement. So uh, I'm an advocate for, I don't think that what I'm saying is against education. It's about right-sizing the budget for education. Thank you very much. Darby Hill, 14 Lincoln Well Road. My wife is covering her face right now. <laughs> Hoping I don't embarrass her too much. I just want to say that we, we love the town, we love the library, and that we have a couple of really rock star teachers that have made a difference in our kids' lives. Um, and you know, I just want to say that you know, the last six years, ever since 2008, have been challenging for everybody. Um, I, I, I'm you know, 44 years old, I don't think I started thinking about things like this until I was 40 in 2008, <laughs> when the bottom fell out. And then you read how many people are unemployed, they've had to move jobs, and they've lost their jobs, they've had to take pay cuts, and I'll be honest with you, I know several of the teachers, and my sister's an educator, she's a teacher in Pennsylvania for 23 years, so I'm able to have very candid discussions with her that I cannot have with my neighbors who are teachers, and we can, we can argue with each other, and I don't have to worry about being shunned by my neighbor, because <laughs> she lives in Pennsylvania, but, you know, you hear things on TV about Scott Walker, collective bargaining, and I, I gotta be honest with you, in 2008, 2009, 2010, there was you know, five years in a row, didn't get a raise, and you start thinking about things like, you know, 
well, the teachers are getting, you know, they're not all true. They're, they're ideas in your mind. You don't know what's true, so you have to go out and find out. Or the teachers getting raises every year, and you're finding out that the town costs, not only the education budget, but the town costs continue to rise, and they go up, and it's difficult. And, uh, you know, when, when we get a chance to vote for the budget, that, that's, that's really the only chance we have to say to you how we feel. I don't know how many people voted, but I think it was like, let's say, 2,000, 3,000 people. Mike? Uh, what was the total number that voted? Oh, okay. What was the total number that voted? 2,600 and the votes failed by 300. So what percentage is that? Over 10%? So it's about 10%. So, I was talking with a co-worker today. I work actually in Plainville. I drive about an hour to go to work now. And uh, he was telling me about the town of Plainville. I don't know how accurate it is, but he talked about how if the town budget fails, the Board of Finance proposes a new budget. If the town budget fails again, or the school budget fails again, another budget is proposed. If the budgets fail a third time, he said that the Board of Finance gets to pick whatever budget they want of the three that were submitted or something like that. I don't know the accuracy, but it, it sounded, it sounded, no, I'm not, I'm not suggesting it's in this town, but I heard that that might be going on in another town. And it, I would just say, listen to the voters. Um, I don't have a lot of time to follow all the details. When I came to vote, I saw some folks that are here tonight standing on one side, and I saw some folks standing on the other side, and they will tell you that I was asking them some very candid questions, trying to get all my education in five minutes before I voted. And John came out and said, there's five minutes left to vote, so get in here if you want to vote. But you can't figure it all out in five minutes. And um, you make your decision. We all have the same right to vote for taxpayers. And I would just ask that the, the boards of finance and listen, listen to the voters. And, uh, and, and if you have to make a cut, um, it should be proportionate, possibly, to the, to the voter turnout. That's all. $75,000 payload of repair and ice, uh, 
repairing hydraulic cylinders while oil was dripping in the back of Fremont's trying to make sure that customers were taken care of with three feet of snow. I did everything I was supposed to do as a man. But I wanted to share something that tonight on this cell phone is a message from a company called N.A. Elite. They are the real estate company that is in charge of Friendly's old property. I haven't answered the call yet because the call is, Mr. Cashman, are you still interested in selling the property at the hardware store? <coughs> I don't know what to do. I know what financial state our home is in. I know how important every dollar is to every person. I know how hard I have worked to make sure that my daughter gets on the school bus every day, and I'm proud to say that my daughter and my wife do a hell of a job with whatever that this man as a provider can give to them at their homes. Do I give up on the town? Every one of you people here tonight know what my family has gone through for the last year. We need to work together to keep this community together, not to drive it apart. We need to be integral in making sure that we're supporting each every person who works into this room. Kurt Carr is not the person making the votes when it comes time to this. It is people who are scared. It is people like Jeff Cashman who gets up every day at 5 o'clock in the morning to feed the animals that puts food on my table on our farm. It is Jeff Cashman who checks on those animals at 9 o'clock at night and rejoice to think that I'm providing meals for my family. That's how hard people are working in this community. The education I wish, there was no child left behind when I was 18. I wish there was a program that would have grabbed me by the neck out of an alcohol-infested family to say, Jeff, you can be somebody with some education. You need to go to business school to see what a value of a dollar is. The guidance counselors need to say, what's going on in that home? Cut all of those little services from every bit of our class in our schools, and you're going to find that you're going to have people who are struggling just as hard as I am every day with trying to figure out where are the bills going to be. I've worked just as hard as anybody in this room, if not harder to provide for my family. I take great pride and say that, you know what, I know how bad things were in our community and I raised 15,000 with the Rotary Club for our food pantry. I know what's going on in this community because I'm involved in the community. Is our, important, is our school important for people just like Jeff Cashman? Don't miss any one of those kids. They might be the next president that comes out of this town. Don't miss the opportunity. I don't want to make that phone call tomorrow and say, you know what, yeah, I'm interested in selling because my brother has a mortgage at home and I've adopted another man who is a good friend who has a mortgage. I don't want the community to give up on me. We needed your support. I could tell you stories tonight of people since we've announced we've had nothing but problems in our community, how people have walked in and would make you cry to think that this community that I've loved have come back and put their arms around the man who's always said, I'm here for you. James Vincent Drive, I love the people for your mulch. You can't possibly imagine Christina Court when that truck goes right up in my backyard and you leave a check on the door how you're supporting my family. You can't imagine some of the subdivisions and if I were to tell you a girl named Katie, she made me cry one day. Bring more, Jeff. Bring more. Bring more. We need each other in this community. We need each other to support each other. We need to make sure we're checking on each other. We need to make sure that we're in support of each other. We need to love each one, each one of us people who are called taxpayers. Kirk Carr, I'm going to sit here and say thank you for making sure that each one of us are paying the proper amount of money. Not one person here would say, Kirk, thank you for taking all the garbage that you've taken in the community either. But you know what? At least there's someone here standing here saying we need to make sure that it's right. 
He doesn't deserve to be disrespected for his opinion. He needs to be respected for it. Just like Jack saying, I'm trying to give your kids a good education. Just like Willie's trying to say, there's a storm coming. Remember that phone call? There's a storm coming. I have no clue. Hang on. We've never seen a storm like that. I've done snoring over for almost 35 years. I've never seen a storm like that. Frank Burns, I probably could sit there and go, I've never seen nothing like that either. We all work together. We got each other. We united as a community. We got together as a community. We helped each other show the way through that storm. What difference is that when it comes down to financial needs? It's a storm we have to weather through and we have to get through it. But let's just be reasonable and help each other. Thanks a lot. Thank you for coming out to the uh, public meetings of our country.